So I'm Lucinda Duncalf. Uh, I'm a Philly serial entrepreneur, one of, the, one of a pretty small crowd. Um, I am currently uh, CEO of Monetate. Monetate's a growth stage, so I think we've graduated beyond startup at this point. Company located out in Conshohocken. We do personalization software for huge brands, huge global brands. So we for really proud uh, over the last couple of weeks. We're now influencing over a third of e-commerce in the US. So we operate it at huge scale. Uh, I also have a startup I'm the chairman of called Real Foodworks, which is the other end of the spectrum, a little company with a few people. Um, and before this, we had at a company called Click Equations that I founded and ran that was a paid search management platform we sold to Channel Intelligence. Before that, um, had a company called Turntide. It was an anti-spam company. We sold to Symantec. And before that, I ran a company called Destiny Software uh, through the internet boom uh, that was in Inc. number 32 on Inc. 500 list. So I have a lot of experience doing this. What I normally do in sessions like this is tell stories. So I come up with some themes that I want to convey and tell stories. But given the audience, um, the Founder Factory folks asked me to do more of a workshop. So the way I, first thing I want to do is everybody who either has a startup or has one sort of you're really truly thinking about, not like a random idea, but you're really thinking about, raise your hand. How many of those are you? OK, now everyone whose hand is not up, look around you and look for those people whose hands are up, because you are going to want to pair with them as we go into these exercises. This is not going to be fun if it's purely academic. So you're going to help these people with their businesses, OK? So everybody got somebody? There's a little pocket back there with no hands up. You guys may have to move. Everybody with us? OK, thanks. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk about how I think about businesses. Oh, I should have mentioned for this crowd, I, I, uh, I also was for, I don't know, six, nine months, um, an entrepreneur in residence at First Run Capital. Uh, I think I'm the only one they ever had. It didn't, I think it was my fault. That didn't work out so well. Um, but I've learned a lot through the years about how to look at and think about early stage businesses and think about their trajectory over time. And so um, I pulled out one of the key uh, tools that I use, think about it, sort of thinking about how to, how to, how to uh, conceptualize a business. I'm going to walk you through a couple of real life examples, faked numbers a little bit and a little bit abstracted, but the principle is real. And then you're going to work in groups to use it, to apply it to your business situation. And then a few of you brave souls are going to share what you came up with with the group. And we'll all talk about um, what you've come up with so that we can learn from each other's examples. Uh, and then I'm going to. Uh, give some, do, do a little advertisement for lean startup kind of ideas and talk about building first, uh, building, selling first and building second. Um, it, this, that's probably the most common mistake that we see uh, with early stage companies is they build before they sell because it seems like you need something to sell but you don't. So that's our, and we'll do, we'll do a similar exercise around that applied to your individual businesses. Is everybody with me? So here's an example. Um, and and I'll, I'll share with you the way that I learned that this is how I think about things is I was working, uh, I, we were early in World Food Works live, life, and I had another founder working for us, um, running engineering. And he said to me, we were, I don't remember what the problem we were working through is, or something, he said, you know, you always do this. I said, what do I say? You always do these like s simple models. I literally was sort of unconscious that I even did it. And I realize now that he said it, I do it for almost everything. So we're going to do it today for a business as a whole and the model, but it works for almost everything. And I think it, 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 uh, what it does is it forces you to think about things analytically. It then teases out issues that you wouldn't see otherwise. And the biggest and the main benefit is you learn what the key drivers of the business are. So I'm going to walk you through an example, then I'll, and I'll share a story about a guy I talked to who really missed this point. 
So if you think about Real Food Works, Real Food Works is a food, a, a prepared meal delivery service. Um, delivers super healthy meals. Um, we now are in, uh, we have a combination of a retail model, so we sell direct to, custom, to consumers through a Real Food Works brand. Our bigger business is White Label, so we do the exact same thing for other brands, for example, Forks Over Knives. Um, the, but this is, if you look at the retail business, the, the sort of highest level way to look at it. So we get on average about $100 a customer a week. Our food cost is only about 40 bucks, but shipping cost is really significant at 25. That leaves us a gross margin of 35 bucks. So a new customer, the first thing in, in this kind of world where you have a physical good, a new customer isn't worth 100 bucks, a new customer is worth 35 bucks a week. Average tenure is about four weeks. In subscription businesses, this can be really tricky. In particular, this one is really tricky because they're almost always in subscription consumer subscription services a power curve. So they fall really fast in the first couple weeks. The magic with Real Food Works, the real reason the model works, is the tail is incredibly long. So four weeks ends up being, um, it's true, but it's also sort of misleading because in fact that's an average of two weeks and a hundred weeks, right? So you get a few that last and last and last. What that means is as you're thinking about how to, how to acquire customers, you can't really think about that average four weeks, even though you have to use it for the math, because those early customers aren't worth four weeks. On the other hand, those long ones, if you can figure out where to find them, are worth a fortune. But nonetheless, you get four weeks. Four times 35 is 140. Now your key question as a business is, so you know this, right? This is pretty, this isn't easy to figure out, but once you get some customers, you see some data, you know this. The key question then is, are you going to be able to, to add customers for $140 or less? Is there enough room in your model? All, so when you get this, what are, your key, what are your key drivers? Your revenue, your, your cost of goods sold, the tenure, and your cost per acquisition, your CPA. There are literally a hundred other variables that go into the cost and into the whole business model equation. They essentially don't matter. These completely cover the whole thing. So I was talking um, to, another, to an entrepreneur who's doing a business where uh, it's an ad tech business where they're selling, they're selling an ad unit that's a different format than existing ad units. That's a complicated thing. So the question is, do you, have to build a, do you have to build a sales force to go sell those directly, all the rest of this? He, he didn't want to use existing ad networks because they take a pretty significant cut of the, of the margin. But when you're little, you don't even know yet, he doesn't even know yet the corollary of these numbers. And he's worried about is his cost going to be 30% or 40%? If that matters, your business model isn't going to work, right? That's too small. So what thinking about it intentionally, intentionally at these broad strokes, more lines in these models is not better. It's worse. What can you abstract up to? How do you, how do you pull out the couple key facts that matter? A different way we looked at this was same exact numbers, right? So we've got revenue, we've got our costs, we've got a gross margin. It turns out we were able to get CPA at about a hundred bucks pretty quickly. So what does that tell you? That means you've got to have your cost per acquisition divided by your gross margin. In other words, this divided by this is about three. So are we going to get tenure that's three weeks or more on average? Same exact math. The only thing that's different is here we knew it was actually faster to figure out that we could get to a CPA of 100. So you can get to that answer, for example, in two weeks. Right? You're going to know kind of generally what realm you're in. Then you have to work on tenure. Whereas in the first model, the problem was you got to just wait to learn tenure. Right? You can't, there's nothing you can do to speed up figuring out how fast your customers are going to churn. So this is, this is real life. This is what we did. We did the first one, and we said, oh, well, that seems like it should work, but oh, we don't know what tenure is. Well, how do we do that? Oh, look, it looks like we can get customers for 100 bucks. 
All right, so we're okay as long as we can get them to last three weeks or more. Does that make sense, everybody? So then an enterprise, um, oh, here we go. No, this is, so then step two. So that's the first step in this process. Now we know we've got this CPA of 100. We know we've got the total average margin over lifetime, which is just your, right, your tenure times the margin, which gives us $100 per customer. Now what if we know our fixed costs are about 10,000 a month? So that's your staff, your space, your hosting, whatever else doesn't scale with your customers. Now that doesn't scale endlessly, right? If, as you get bigger, that's going to grow. But at a base level, if you've got to get, you've got to cover your nut of 10 grand, that means you need a, 100 customers. Does that make sense? So your first goal, your first hurdle, outside funding aside, um, is can I get to 100 customers? That, right, so that's step two. How do I cover my costs? Generally, in the startup world, you don't worry about this until you've figured out the first one. But this is what saves you from being eaten alive by investors. Does that all make sense, everybody with me? So now a different example. Uh, here's a SaaS company, and we'll talk here about why SaaS companies tend to eat so much capital. So in a SaaS company, say your average contract value, that's what, right, what it, somebody's going to give you for a year minus your cost customer acquisition cost say it costs you about 70 grand 70 grand per customer means basically you put all your marketing all your sales people the commissions all the rest of that's going to cost you an average of 70,000 that gives you 30,000 in the top of the bucket your cost of goods sold which is your service people and your hosting and all that is 50 grand and this is all aside from development and all the other costs you have right that means you're losing $20,000 in year one on that customer. Does that mean it's a bad business? No, actually that means it's a great business, right? Because year two, your ACV is going to grow. Hopefully you've got more stuff to sell the customer. They're using the product more, whatever it is. So you're up to 110. You already acquired the customer. You know what I mean? Cost of acquisition. So you've got, got 55,000 in COGS because it's 50% and you're total revenue went up, which means I'm making 55 grand this year on that customer. If you add the two together, so far we're, da we're up 35,000. Next year, same math happens, we're up 90,000. This is the magic of recurring revenue businesses, SaaS businesses, and why it makes sense to go out and finance that 20,000. You want to do this all day, all day long, as long as you're as long as your stream is higher than your cost of capital, which it will be if you're doing a halfway decent job. Right? So if you can't, so that initial kind of modeling I did in a, in a real Foodworks case, even though it's a subscription business, it's so short, it's essentially like selling a single thing. Very different way you think about that model than how you think about a recurring revenue um, subscription service like a SaaS company. So does that make sense to everybody? We all on the same page? Yeah? All right, so now it's your turn, so I don't have to work so hard today. So find a partner or two. One of you at least must have a business that is either real or that you're working on. Um, I want you to create a back of the envelope model. So, uh, I'm going to want a couple of you to be willing to share, stand up, and describe your model, and it should be simple enough to describe without any audiovisual support. Um, and then we'll all talk about it. And you're going to have, we're going to try the first one. You have five minutes to do it. So go, find your partner. This will also make you meet people, which is good. <laughs> I teach martial arts and I'm very used to going and everyone lines up. Not you guys. Okay, so volunteers. I'm going to pick on some. All right, great. You got to come up because of the camera. All right. So this is 
the idea that uh, a classmate had, but so it's not in operation right now. We're kind of spitballing, but we think we're confident and we're going to revolutionize healthcare. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're what we're offering is value proposition for to improve patient care with virtual reality. So you think uh, long-term care patients, dialysis patients, oncology patients. A lot of the times they're sitting in a patient or in um in a room getting dialysis care 20 hours a week. It can be painful, uncomfortable, um, and to improve quality of life. Uh, and actually, a lot of studies show that it improves. If they could picture themselves being somewhere else, they could improve the the outcome as well. So to do this, um, we're going to offer a low end and option uh, VR platforms. On the high end would be your Oculus Rifts, and on your low end would be Google Cardboard. So we looked at, first of all, the kind of the cycle of the patient and the patient care. Um, you have your patient who requires care. They go to a provider who gives them care. Uh, they have this experience, for better or for worse. Um, and then results, and so the results can end care. For, for good, like they're, they're cured or they're better, so they leave the cycle, or they, uh, in a more negative way, you know, they pass away and they leave the cycle, or they uh, have to go back through that cycle again. So where we fit into that cycle is when they're getting the care and at that experiential level. So our costs for the low end and the high end, uh, Google Cardboard costs around twenty dollars right now, Oculus Rift costs three hundred dollars. We would be either selling or leasing. Um, I think at first we would lease the VR component as kind of a proof of concept to the hospital or the caregiver. Um, distribution, we estimated at $20 uh, per unit, whether that's shipping uh, to California or local here at CHOP. And then we, we considered, you know, there's the new technology platform, the nursing staffs, the doc doctor staffs uh, might not know how to use them or troubleshoot them. So we estimated $50 per cost per unit to have um, us available to troubleshoot it, to be on site if needed, or available with uh, webcast or on phone to troubleshoot it for them. So um, they're getting their money's worth. And then uh, we, we questioned, do we need clinical trials? We said at this time, that's not going to cost anything. There is research showing this, uh, these items. So our clinical cost is, would be nothing at this point. Making Variable cost for the low end option, $90, and the uh, high end option, $370. You do a multiple of five, um, our pricing would be $400 for the cardboard and uh, $1,600 for the Oculus Rift. Um, our customer is, again, the provider, the healthcare provider, and our um, the end user is the patient. Um, some, and then lastly, identify some risk that we might have to. Um, Consider um, is the demand actually there? Will doctors see the value proposition here? Um, a liability concern. If someone is in this VR component, there is um, about five percent of people that go through VR feel nauseous going through. So uh, mitigating that, and then uh, the, the prove the effectiveness of it, and is the value proposition actually there? So about your cost of acquisition. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> it's going to be big with doctors, probably. What, yeah. So why sell the doctor plan if that's actually the case? Because you can have your partner share with your partner. And like offer it as an, you know, like rent it during your. The insurance providers. The insurance providers. What else? Other thoughts? Does that make sense to everybody? You think you captured the key? things or no? So I'll be candid. Please. Classmate. I went to Wharton too. Um, but I wasn't a veteran. Um, or I'm not still. Um, I think you've missed really the, the, so you got the gross margin piece of it. Yeah. But you, but in there, the cost of acquisition for anything like this, especially something new, is sure. huge. Um, and then, so you'd, you'd want to flow through and then at least have a high level, again, this back of the envelope. So how many units do you have to do? Because you've got software development and all the rest. How many would you have to sell to cover whatever your development cost is? Well, and so one of the things we, we brought up were the, the content that you show in the VR. And there's content already available there. So I don't think we would go into, but we wouldn't have to, to 
develop that end of it. So you just be sort of selling the stuff that's already there. Right. And you're assuming also everybody's got a device. Uh, no, that would be the distribution. That would be our main. Process. But like cardboard, you know, if you use cardboard. So cardboard, you, yeah. you need a, you need a, uh, a phone. A phone. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. So we're assuming that, exactly. which isn't actually true for much of the that's patient population too. All right, great. So we have five minutes. Thank you. Okay. We have with two minutes, which means we're not going to get a second one. This definitely didn't seem like 40 minutes. Um, so in my last two minutes, I'm going to make a different point, which is sell first and build second. I'm going to talk for a second, my two minutes, about Real Food Works. So the, the innovation in the Real Food Works model was that we use the excess capacity in the existing food supply system, caterers and restaurants, to make the food. So they've already paid for the kitchen for the staff. They've already paid for the kitchens. They already have existing supply relationships. We leverage all that. The first question we had was, would they actually do that? We really had it was a great theory. Didn't know. So the, literally the first week of the company's existence, we went out on the street and knocked on restaurant doors during the middle of the afternoon, and the answer was. Yes, they were really happy about an additional revenue stream that didn't have the normal cost structure associated with it. Check. If that didn't work, nothing was going to work. The next one was, OK, how do we get initial customers? We just used our own personal social networks. So we tweeted. Um, this was pre-Instagram. Um, and we got our first, I think we had 25 customers kind of right at the beginning. So remember, what we were driving towards was filling in that high-level model. How long are these people going to last? Knowing that it's a little weird because they're our, they're our followers, so they're not kind of standard. Then the next one was all those key metrics. So how much is it actually going to cost us to get the food? At that time, we weren't shipping. We were doing ground delivery and hand delivery. So how much is it going to cost us to deliver? And how long do these customers stay? We had these nailed literally within about six weeks. We were guessing on longevity. And that's why we did. Remember, I did the second model where we said, let's work CPA backwards. Um, so that's an example of how we did it. Another example that I'll say Josh Koppelman taught me, we used to do when we were, when we were working on business ideas, we would, we would use AdWords, um, which at the time was super cheap, still pretty cheap, and a landing page. Literally, that was it. No product, no nothing. An ad and a single page. And the click-through on the ad and the click-through on the page would give us so much data about whether there was actually consumer interest or not. So I use that as an example because I think lots of people get in this, I don't have a thing, right? You can have literally nothing and still go out and learn a whole ton of things about your business. So um, I'll show the last one just because I had a picture on it. We were going to do another exercise. I'd like you to do, if you're a founder or you've got a company, do this yourself just uh, after you leave, is what can you sell before building? I was in a little group here where we've got somebody who's got um, uh, a, uh, a uh, talent matching sort of website. We, you know, she's already got an app. I would have, if I'd met her six months ago, said, just go sell it. Don't build anything. Build a, build a keynote deck and go sell it. And if you can sell it, then build it. Right? That's really the fundamental principle of lean. And we all know that, and yet we don't actually do it. So that's my comments for now. Have, do I have time for one question or no? One question they said I can have. Anybody have a question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'll, uh, I don't know. What, what's the easiest way to do that? Should I just tweet it? Or post, I can post it somewhere. I don't know. I'll figure something out. Yeah, if you want it, just why don't you, so my email, um, just direct, just direct message me on Twitter. It's Lucinda D, and I'll get it to you somehow. The letter D or D? The letter D, as in D for Duncalf. There's like a six, now 16-year-old who has Lucinda, and I would just love to buy it from her, but I can't. <laughs> and she only tweets like once in two months, but uh, she won't give it to me. <laughs> one last one, and then I'm, get, and I'm letting you go. Yep, totally prepared. You just you just heat it up in the oven. Okay. Yep. That? That's what we don't need that detail for everybody. <laughs> um, you can go look at the Real Food Works site. Okay, I'll be here for a couple minutes if people have questions. Thanks a lot.